Greetings from the Bonehenge Whale Center in Beaufort, North Carolina. What you're looking at is what I envision will be the public entrance when we are open, after we have water and sewer utilities, which hopefully will be coming sometime this year. Whew, there's a lot going on in this picture. A right whale mandible archway, a pair of toothy sperm whale mandibles, and a complete skeleton of a dry speak whale, some inspiring and relevant, culturally significant artwork, and a lot more. Probably a appropriate backdrop in which to create a presentation about North Carolina cetaceans. I'm Keith Rittmaster, natural science curator at the North Carolina Maritime Museum. I'm going to introduce you to what we've been learning about North Carolina cetaceans over the past uh, three decades or so. And very briefly, I'm going to cover each of these topics during this presentation. Bear with about 20 seconds of taxonomy, please. Whales, dolphins, and porpoises are in a taxonomic order that is now called Cetarchidiodactyla. I'm sorry if I destroyed the pronunciation of that formerly cetacea. And within that order are two suborders, uh, tooth whales or odontoceti, and those are the tooth whales that we have in, don't have in North Carolina. And baleen whales is the other subgroup or was suborder, and it includes uh, two families of baleen whales. You survived 20 seconds of taxonomy. Baleen versus toothed whales, in case uh, you'd like a refresher or didn't know the difference. Baleen whales lack teeth, and rather they have uh, baleen plates, 100 of them, that are attached and suspended from the upper jaws through which they feed. Conversely, Tooth whales, and this is a toothy bottlenose dolphin, which is a technically a small tooth whale. Tooth whales have teeth. Um, some of them never have erupted teeth, and maybe we'll cover that as well. But anyway, so tooth whales and baleen whales, and that's the basic. Graphically, it looks like this. This poster, when it was published about 10 years ago, uh, reflected all of the approximately 90 species of cetaceans worldwide. In this poster, all the baleen whales are facing toward me or facing toward the right, and the tooth whales are facing toward the left. So the biggest animal to ever live on Earth, the blue whale in the upper left, here's a fun fact, the biggest animal on Earth is a girl, because in blue whales, as in most baleen whales, girls are bigger than boys. And then on the upper right, the largest tooth whale is the sperm whale. But the only cetacean you're likely to see year round in North Carolina from beaches, docks, and piers from the shore uh, is at the tip of the rostrum of a humpback whale there, and it's a bottlenose dolphin. However, we have been able to document some, some impressive diversity in North Carolina and I'm going to attempt to show you that now. I've just circled all of the species of tooth whales that we have documented in North Carolina. Now I'm gonna circle, take those circles away and circle all the species of baleen whales that we have documented in North Carolina. This is North Carolina wildlife. Most of these, most people have never heard of. Now this is, the image is about to get really messy and that's sort of my point. Now I've circled all the species of cetaceans that we have documented. It's 34 species and that includes uh, some very rare ones that are only have been documented once either as a live sighting or stranding but nonetheless uh, that's what we've documented and I would work hard to prove me wrong and I'm not bragging but this is more than any other state in the country. As far as I can tell, this is more than all of the states to our north combined. 
and this is more than all the states to our south combined. What is up with that? Well, you probably recognize the southeast United States, and offshore there are two continental shelves, what um, many refer to as the inner shelf, and then a, a more significant outer shelf. And they both host unique wildlife, including cetaceans. Fishermen know that certain species of fish associate with each one, birders as well, and we whale people are discovering the same with whales. But my point in showing you this is where do those two continental shelves converge? Right off North Carolina. And where are they closest to the coast? Right off North Carolina. So I think that contributes to the um, high number of cetacean species we've been able to document. Now this next slide is going to be same land, same water, different colors, sea surface temperature, red being very warm water and blue being very cool water. And I just grabbed this from a, a, a March uh, plot because it's the month of March that I'm saying here. And I just wanted to show you what uh, you might be familiar with, uh, northbound current of the Gulf Stream that brings warm tropical water up the southeast coast. And then there's the Labrador Current Extension. I think that's a generally accepted name for it, the cool water that comes down the east coast. And where do those two water temperatures, those two currents collide right off North Carolina? So I think consequently, um, in our documentation, we, we can reflect some northern limits of southern species and some southern limits of northern species uh, all off North Carolina. So I hope that made sense. And I just want to mention a few ter anatomical terms I might be using uh, so you that maybe you're familiar with them. In case I slip back into scientific jargon, the tail or flukes are interchangeable terms. I might say that the whale raised its flukes before it dove. That's a common behavior. Pectoral fins or flippers. Cetaceans have two of them, homologous to our arms. The dorsal fin, all cetaceans in North Carolina have a dorsal fin except one, and that is the North Atlantic right whale lacks a dorsal fin. Blowhole, unlike you and I and terrestrial mammals, uh, they can't breathe through their mouths. All the air exchange occurs through the blowhole. Beak or rostrum are terms that are used interchangeably, the tip of the snout. And the melon between the blowhole and the rostrum uh, is an organ that I think most people agree primary function is to manipulate sound, specifically focus, modulate, and amplify sound. Because as far as we know, their world is sound much like ours is vision. And I'll play a couple sound clips for you, I hope this works. And a good look at a bottomless dolphin with an open blowhole taking a breath. Uh, just briefly, I wanted to highlight not much more than the fact that North Carolina was a whaling destination. Whaling occurred in North Carolina, uh, pelagically, meaning offshore, and the sperm whales on top, that was a primary target of pelagic whalers off North Carolina, but many other species were taken. Shore-based whaling, and I've shown the North Atlantic right whale here, which was a primary target of shore-based whaling, but many other species were taken. And then the uh, net fishery for bottlenose dolphins, which occurred for, I think, most of a century and a half, maybe, and ended in the early 1920s, I think, uh, targeting our coastal bottlenose dolphins. And if you live in Carter County, you have definitely seen this image, the county seal or the county coat of arms. And maybe you didn't notice that it features a pair of North Atlantic right whales. How do I know that? Because they lack a dorsal fin. And my point here is that someone at some point in time thought that whales were significant enough to our wildlife, our culture, our history to feature on the county seal. So you'll see this image on every county vehicle, on every county building, every county website or piece of stationery. 
And just a word about the net fishery for bottomless dolphins. If you look in historic and even scientific literature, you'll see references to the North Carolina porpoise fishery, and it might get a little confusing. I just want you to understand that they weren't porpoises and they weren't fish. They are um, in these pictures, and as far as I can tell, the catch was targeting and included bottomless dolphins. And as far as I can tell from looking at the photos, a, a porpoise was never taken in this fishery. They probably caught a lot of other things. I'm, I imagine sharks and rays and more. But anyway, uh, it was uh, targeting bottomless dolphins. And I'll talk about more the differences in a minutes. This is a right whale mom and her very young calf. The mom is swimming away facing the upper right of this image and the calf much darker is facing to the left. And researchers studying right whales identify individual right whales through a process called photo identification and it's the growths on the head called callosities that are individually distinctive. This is a close up. The blowhole is toward the left, the tip of the snout, the rostrum is underwater, but it's off to the upper right. And the lower jaw is arching above the upper jaw and you can get a good look at the callosities. Good enough for the good folks in New England who track these animals as individuals can identify this very quickly. In fact, if I see a right whale and get a picture like this and I send it to Phil Hamilton, uh, you know, at, the, at 1030 at night by 11, He's replied with not only the idea of the animal, but uh, the, the sex, the reproductive history, and what's known about it. I say, Phil, that's just amazing. You can do that. And Phil says, well, really, Keith, it's just kind of depressing. There's so few left. If you tell me that you've uh, photographed a right whale and had a calf, I know it's a reproductive female, and we know all those animals off the top of our head. So we really um, can identify these because there's just so few left. I think most people agree there's about 400 left. And so this is one week in North Carolina, there happened to be two moms with newborns. And uh, I was just, just so impressed that Phil just told me the names of them pr pretty quickly. And so these, I don't know if you can tell that they're in different individuals or if you just wanna take my word for it. Two adult female North Atlantic right whales right here in Beaufort Inlet. Humpback whale, that's probably the large whale that we're most likely to see from the beach. Generally, October through April, maybe exclusively October for, through April. I just, I'm, I've never seen one outside of those months. So they're here during the cool water months, generally not resident here. They seem to pass through primarily and uh, they have a characteristic hump before the dorsal fin. And on my side or the camera side of this photo is a bottlenose dolphin. It's very rare that I see a humpback whale around here that isn't associated with bottomless dolphins. Quite frankly, it looks like the dolphins um, are harassing the whale. And this is a humpback whale feeding right off of Shackleford Banks. It's Moorhead City in the background. And uh, outside of the humpback's mouth are some terrified menhaden. And you can see the baleen in the upper jaw of this humpback whales and barnacles uh, attached to it on the lower jaw. So it's engulfing tons of water and fish and it closes his mouth and it uses its huge tongue to push the water out and the baleen lets water out but keeps the fish in. And this is a good picture my friend and volunteer John Russell took of a humpback whale. And there are some curious scars on this tail. This is the ventral, the bottom side of the tail. And Photo ID is used to study humpback whales too, to, and the, a photo like this is used to individually identify a humpback whale. Other features are too, but this photo is just uh, pretty good for that. You see a barnacle on the tips of the tail and those uh, scars that go vertically toward the center of the tail are evidence of entanglement, past entanglement that this whale uh, survived. Um, and those color patterns 
dark white color patterns are distinct enough to identify individual whales. Uh, here's just an example of a, a, a sighting, series of sightings of a humpback whale, one that we photographed off Shackleford Banks. A year later was documented off George's Bank off Cape Cod. No surprise there that those movements are pretty well understood. But the cool thing about this is that 13 years later, that same individual whale was photographed by a film crew in Bermuda. Uh, you may not think it's a big deal. It's just, it was an oh wow, because this had not been documented before, as far as I know. And this is how we learn about the movements and association, uh, and migratory endpoints of, uh, of some of these whales. I want to introduce you to the North Carolina Marine Mammal Stranding Network. You see the coast of North Carolina on the right and the list of organizations are the ones that take a leader leadership role. And we get the calls of every dead or dying or entangled marine mammal in North Carolina. And that could include any one of the 34 species I mentioned of cetaceans, but we've also documented four species of pinnipeds, seals, and also we have the uh, manatee, the West Indian manatee in North Carolina. And uh, we get average probably 140, 150 strandings a year. So the stranding network uh, stays pretty busy and each stranding can place us on the edge of science in many, many ways. So this is an example of a response and this is a humpback whale at Hatteras and it's stranded alive, died on the beach. I forget the cause of death, but I wanna show you something about photo ID. I mean, eight people could not lift the tail of this whale to figure out who the individual is. So what do you do? Well, you attempt to cut the tail off and get a backhoe to lift it up. So this is that tail of that humpback whale, um, the deceased humpback whale. And now I'm gonna shrink this picture to the lower left, I mean, to the lower right. And I'm gonna flip it upside down. I hope you're with me. Now I'm gonna bring in John Russell's picture of that live, presumably healthy humpback whale off Shackleford Banks that I already showed you. And we and many other people spend an embarrassing amount of time trying to figure out if things like this are matches. So look at this. And you see darker on the right tip of the tail than the left tip. And you see the entanglement scars near the center of the tail. And you see white fading to dark in approximately the same areas. And people a lot brighter and more dedicated than I determined that this was not a match. But darn, isn't it close? And that's how photo ID works for humpback whales. Well, we got this call one evening and I decided I didn't think it was safe to go out in a boat after dark and look for a needle in a haystack, which could end up being a very um, entangled and upset whale. So I thought if it were reported again in the morning, I'd go out and darn it, six something in the morning, a fisherman reported this entangled whale of Fort Macon. A beach walker had reported it the night before. She said she was just walking down the beach and she watched the whale swim into the net and then turn offshore and drag the net with it. That was the original report. And then the next morning, a, a fisherman reported and I just, I asked him to stay there till I or somebody could get there and take, take over uh, monitoring it. And this is what I found. And it was a humpback whale, um, very active, uh, actually behaving surprisingly normally for being entangled all night. And there were some gill net floats on it. and. Uh, my job was not to touch the whale or touch the gear, just stand by till a, a team of trained people could actually uh, assist in either tagging the gear or disentangling the whale. It was bloody, it was injured, it was badly entangled, but it was still lifting its flukes up and diving, so it had a fair amount of energy. And I tried to get a picture of the ventral portion of the flukes for ID photos. I don't know if this is ever ID'd. And then this whale did something I had never seen before. 
it took a breath, lifted its tail up, did a deep dive, and energetically burst out of the water again, and it had shed what I thought was the entire net. Uh, there's a good picture of the dorsal fin, a pair of blowholes, uh, characteristic of a humpback whale. This is that entangled whale. And it swam away, and I started to follow it. Then I realized, oh, no, no, there's a net behind me, and that could entangle something else. So I didn't attempt to document the whale any further. It looked pretty energetic. I knew it was injured, but I wanted to get the net out of the water. And then uh, I got some help from uh, uh, Vicky Thayer, Division of Marine Fisheries and Seamast, and uh, Doug Novacek and team from Duke. And we were able to not only get all the net out of the water, but actually spread it out and, uh, you know, and document that it was, we got the entire net. Entire skeleton of a humpback whale. My friend Bruce is lying next to it. This is a big three-year-old girl, 37 feet long, and she was hit by a ship. And when she was hit by a ship, her skull was broken in two pieces, exposed her brain. She probably died instantly. And we have this entire skeleton um, here in Bonehenge. And I very much look forward to assembling this skeleton and displaying it somewhere, either here in the Bonehenge Whale Center or um, possibly somewhere else. But I want to get this story out because ship strikes on large whales is an important conservation issue. This was a live stranding of a sperm whale. By the time we got to it, it was very fresh, dead on the beach. That's in the left photo. And about nine, eight, eight or nine years later, there's a picture of it on display in the North Carolina Maritime Museum. That's a sperm whale, 33 and a half feet long. The same year we put that whale on display at the Maritime Museum, another sperm whale came ashore in North Carolina, 33 and a half feet long. And that was it up at Hatteras. I think that's Bill McClellan in the background and my wife Vicki Thayer went up to assist with the necropsy and Vicki called me and said, Keith, it's a sperm whale. And I said, yeah, I heard. How long is it? And she said, 33 and a half feet long. And I said, whoa, that's the exact same size as Echo, the sperm whale we just installed at the Maritime Museum. And she said, do you want the skeleton? <laughs> I have connections. And, I, and uh, I said, no, I don't have the time or the money or the space, but would you grab a tooth for me? And she said, sure, which tooth would you like? And so I rumbled around my desk and I saw that I had uh, the 10th tooth from the front on the I think left side. And I asked her to get that tooth for me. And so she did. Check this out. So that's that whale from Hatteras, 2013. This is the whale from Cape Lookout, 2004. That's on display at the Maritime Museum. And those are the two teeth, wildly different. So the left tooth is the whale on the left, the right tooth is the whale on the right, same species, same position in the jaw, same geographical region, same length. And what you can't see from the photos of the teeth is the one with more erosion and the one that's bigger is more filled in. That's the one on the left. And the one on the right from Echo is more hollow. Why are those teeth so wildly different? And the answer is different sex. They are the same size or the same length, but at 33 and a half feet long, a girl, a female will be an old whale because they don't get much bigger than that. A male at 33 and a half feet long would likely be an adolescent. And if it grew up to be an old whale, it would double in size. So you might think, well, males are bigger, so the big tooth must belong to the male. But no, if they're the same length, the whale, uh, the younger whale will have a smaller, less eroded, more hollow tooth. 
I hope that makes sense. That's what this demonstrates. Stomach contents of a young live sperm whale that came ashore in North Carolina. One pattern we're seeing, uh, or I think we're seeing, is that the deeper divers tend to have more plastic in their stomachs. The beaked whales and the sperm whales and the kogias, uh, which is our dwarf and, uh, and pygmy sperm whales, uh, are more likely to have plastic than the shallower divers, like some of the baleen whales or bottomless dolphins, which they swim close to the coast, they swim more in our trash, I'd expect to find more plastic in their stomachs, and that doesn't seem to be the case. Okay, acoustic intermission coming up, if this works, I hope it does. This is a sound clip of, I think, three sperm whales. Interestingly, if you go offshore near the continental shelf edge off North Carolina, day or night, summer or winter, if you don't see sperm whales, you are very likely to hear them. They don't spend much time at the surface. Their life is deep, dark, high pressure. And, they're, um, and they make sounds that are very distinctive. So let's see if this works. Whalers used to call them carpenter fish because the sounds sound like hitting a nail on a head from a distance. You'll be very disappointed if you're expecting the repeating melodic songs of humpback whales. This is uh, sperm whales. Well, that's it. We don't know what they're saying, but we think it's very, very important. And a lot of bright, talented people are learning a lot about sperm whales based on the sounds they make. This is a adult female device beaked whale near the circle at Atlantic Beach, something you don't see every day. And we didn't collect a skeleton, but we did prepare a display of the skull of that. Beaked whales, fascinating animals. They only have two teeth. Those teeth are only in the lower jaw. And as far as I can tell, those teeth only emerge in adult males. Females, perfectly nourished, don't have erupted teeth. What are teeth for? And how do they feed? I think our best, um, best evidence suggests that they're mainly suction feeders and the teeth have little or no function for feeding. And adult males have erupted teeth possibly do a um, uh, fight with, they use them in conflict with other males. So this is a Gervais beaked whale. Since it's an adult female, it does not have erupted teeth out of the gum. I mean, you can see the two teeth. They are out of the bone, but they were not out of the gum. True's beaked whale, another species of beaked whale. Interesting thing about True's beaked whale is the holotype, the type specimen. The specimen from which scientists base the identification of this species, where it was discovered, uh, is in Beaufort, North Carolina, on the west end of Bird Shoal. True's beaked whale animal. Cuvier's beaked whale, again, North Carolina wildlife. This was one in, actually in Cape Lookout Lake, out of its normal habitat. but. Uh, Great, talented, dedicated folks at UNC Wilmington and Duke Marine Lab uh, are teaching us that North Carolina may be the world's hotspot for this species of whales, where this, the highest density or abundance of Cuvier's beaked whale congregate. And we've learned that they're extremely deep divers. And as far as we know, as far as records have been able to or tags have been able to document they're the deepest diving air breather on earth so far that we know of. Cuvier's beaked whale. Another beaked whale, uh, Zoplodon fencerosperus, Plainville's beaked whale. This is on Ochre Coast, and there's a branding response team. And 
right above my head here is the skull. And you see two tusks. Those are the teeth. Since they're outside the jaw when the jaw is closed, I think they're called tusks. Uh, so I knew without any further investigation that this was an adult male because it had erupted tusks, Blainville's B12. Risso's dolphin, not likely to see it. Close to shore, healthy, but this one, uh, well, this is one that uh, Dave Johnson has a marine lab photograph. I love this photo here. And this on the left is one that came ashore alive in Kill Level Hills, and we built a skeletal display out of it uh, that has been at the Outer Bank Center for Wildlife Education and may make its way back up there again. So we were on our way out of town uh, when we got this report from a ferry captain that there was what appeared to be a pilot whale alive on Sand Dollar Island, which is right, I'm not sure if it's part of the Ray Carson Visitor Reserve or not, but it's just on the, on the south side of the edge of the Ray Carson Reserve. And I had a boat in the water and got some gear together. And there it is, and it was alive, and it was lying in a pool of blood. And it's pretty active, and I'm supposed to be some kind of expert. And I was confused. I could not identify this. I thought maybe it was a hybrid between a Rizzo's and a Ponlo's. It's nothing I had ever seen on a beach before. And I forgot that I had seen them alive. But anyway, as soon as it opened its mouth and presented lots of small teeth on the upper and lower jaws, I instantly knew it was. Um, uh, lag and rankus, either a white beak or a white sided dolphin. Anyway, it turned out to be a white beak dolphin, the southernmost record ever recorded of the species, and uh, ended up being our 34th species that we documented. So, a very unusual white beak dolphin that uh, swam into our estuary and died on Sand Dollar Island in Beaufort. Just some other species of dolphins I wanted to introduce you to. I mentioned uh, Clindini's dolphin. Striped dolphin, these are you're not likely to see them close to the beach. They all have slightly different shapes and colors and habitats. Long spouted spinner dolphin. Uh, this is named for the uh, curious behavior of actually spinning several times on a free axis when you dive. This is a still of a spinner dolphin spinning in the center of the sand bar. Common dolphins, uh, fairly common along the continental shelf edge. Very distinctive white thoracic patch enables the identification of the species. Probably the most abundant cetacean on the continental slope is uh, the Atlantic spotted dolphin, shown here. And further offshore is another species of spotted dolphin, pantropical spotted dolphin. But again, all North Carolina wildlife. Pilot whales. Uh, can predictably be found in certain areas off North Carolina. False killer whales have been documented here, alive for sure, and I think as a stranded as well. Orcas or killer whales. Uh, we have one record of a stranding that's uh, represented in this picture here. It was at Kill Devil Hills, I think. It was towed or pushed offshore alive, and I'm not sure whatever happened to that one. That was in 1970s. But we've got plenty of good photos and video documenting, documenting killer whales, orcas or killer whales from in North Carolina. So they are North Carolina wildlife included on our list. And this was a curious case, possibly an opportunity for a rescue or something. I really didn't know. But um, again, uh, we got a boat in the water, so we went over to investigate. And this is what I saw. That's a gentleman who reported it. And uh, I tell it's not a bottle of dolphin, but I wasn't sure whether it was a dwarf sperm whale or a pygmy sperm whale. But it was way out of its habitat. And their habitat is 30, 40 miles offshore. You will not see a healthy one on the slope or anywhere close to the beach, as far as I know. Uh, and by morning, uh, other sightings were alive on that day, that April 1st day. And then by morning, it was dead on the beach. And every time 
this happens if we were around the, like the you know teachable moment, and we were able to um, um study it necrop and since as far as I know there was no dwarf sperm whale skeleton certainly not in North Carolina maybe not in this country we did rearticulate it for display so this is that skeleton and it's here in the bone end whale center uh, offshore bottlenose dolphin clearly a different species of other offshore from other offshore dolphins and clearly a different species from bottlenose dolphin I think you know someone can take the time to sort out the genetics the morphometrics and this would be a new name species right now uh, Technically, in all the books, uh, it's it's called Tristop truncated bottlenose dolphin or bottlenose dolphin, but I, I believe this will be a, a newly named cetacean uh, at some point. Very different than our coast bottlenose dolphin. External appearance, morphometric, and range. Okay, another acoustic information. This is a group of about 17 dolphins off Shackleford Bank. And I mentioned a little bit about the melon. Now, sound production occurs. They don't have vocal cords. They don't need to open their mouths to make sound. The sound is created by, as far as we know, switching air back and forth in the region of the air sacs that are shown in this image. That sounds like a dolphin. I'm squishing air under my tongue. And so this is about a 30-second sound clip. At the risk of you falling sound asleep, feel free to just close your eyes and really listen to the uh, these sounds. We'll hear, I believe, signature whistles, echolocation, clicks, and a sound that's been referred to as the Big Bang. It's been demonstrated that dolphins, probably other cetaceans, can make a sound so powerful, so focused, so intense and loud it can kill or stun a fish. Sounds like a cap gun or a distance gunshot. And it's always preceded by echolocation clicks. So, yeek, yeek. That was a horrible imitation. Let's see if this works. I call that the dolphin's greatest hits because every sound I've heard him make is in that little clip. And this is a bottlenose dolphin exhaling. Those are air bubbles coming from the blowhole just before it breaks the surface to take a breath of air. And locally, actually regionally, I and many colleagues up and down the coast identify individual dolphins by the scars and even more so the notches that they acquire on their dorsal fins, such as this one, which is one we named Zephyr, which we see here in the winter time and never in the summertime. We had documented it once in Ocracoke as well. And this just summarizes a uh, photo ID uh, that we use the dorsal fins to learn about uh, many things, uh, migratory endpoints, associations, birth rates, and so on. Uh, as an example, this is a, probably our best known pair of dolphins, onion and butterfly. Butterfly's name is blocked by my image there. Don't know how to control that. But anyway, uh, from 1992, and here they are in 2011, so 19 years later. Maybe you didn't get a good look at them, but take my word for it, uh, they are the same dolphins. And every time we saw them, they were side by side. And wherever we saw them, and they were only here in the summer, in the winter time. But the folks at the Outer Banks Center for Dolphin Research and Nagzed Dolphin Watch knew this pair very well because they were in Ro they, Roanoke Sound was their beat, uh, and it's still Onion's beat. But anyway, uh, Onion and Butterfly, 
they were an adult male pair that stuck together for as far as we could tell they're you know most or all of their lives until this karen clark at the center for wildlife education in Kerala called me up she said keith i heard there was a dead dolphin on the beach here's the image but uh someone said the dorsal fin is distinctive so stand by i'm going to text you a picture of the dorsal fin and so this is a dead dolphin that was reported on the beach of Kildare Devil Hills, and that was his dorsal fin, and this was an oh wow moment to me and the people I work with, because no mistake about it, that is Onion's life mate, Butterfly, and that's Butterfly in life, so maybe you can tell that it's the same individual, and Karen did a necropsy, which is an autopsy on a non-human, and in the stomach of the butterfly, she found pieces of monofilament fishing net. Just some fun photos. A pair of airborne dolphins in the estuary. Uh, this is right off the museum's watercraft center in Taylor's Creek. That's Duke Marine Lab in the background. What is going on here? That's a, uh, people call it cannonball jelly. That's a common name or Stomolophus is the taxonomic genus. I don't know why dolphins do it. We call it jellyfish frisbee, but they don't throw it back and forth to each other. They just, one dolphin will toss it in the air and then chase it down and toss it again. Not sure why, never seen them bite it, never found jellyfish pieces in their stomachs. Kind of looks like fun, but if you ever have an opportunity to take a really close look at these cannonball jellyfish you'll find that it's more than just a jellyfish it's a whole community and without a doubt every time you look at one there's there is a community of small fish hanging out and if you pick one up their sting is very mild if at all I, i've never felt it um but if you do pick one up this next picture is going to be inside the mantle of this jellyfish that i pulled out of the water and always there's a fish or two in there I think that's a, a trigger fish, a young, tiny trigger fish. And there's always zero to one, never two, arrow crabs, which is uh, also shown in this picture. So maybe the dolphins are throwing it just to try to dislodge the fish for fun or trying to get an appetizer. Looks like a, a needlefish or something related to a needlefish in the mouth of this dolphin in the Moorhead City Turning Basin. What? is that that is a ray that ray is upside down that ray is in the dolphin's mouth head first if you told me you saw this i would have told you you were wrong i couldn't have believed that this would be possible but that entire ray wings and all folded right up and went into the mouth of that dolphin this is the first time I'd ever seen something like that, and I've seen it a couple times since. They may be the original and the best surfers. This is six or seven dolphins in, in a wave off Cape Lagoon Lighthouse. Okay, what's that that my friend Greg is holding? It's a dolphin fish or mahi-mahi. And when Greg tells me that he get in, got into the dolphins really thick, I know that he's talking about the fish, not the mammal. And often fishermen and often scientists too, when they see the mammal, they will refer to them as porpoises to clarify that they're not talking about the fish. And so a very common question is, is there a difference between dolphin and porpoise? And if so, what is it? And yes, there is a difference. I've plied the waters of North Carolina for uh, several decades and I've never seen a live healthy porpoise in North Carolina. What we see year round from the beaches or docks, piers, in the rivers are bottlenose dolphins. I don't care if you correct anyone, and uh, uh, but they are not porpoises. Some year I'll be wrong, but so far, <laughs> anyway. Uh, this is a harbor porpoise, Fosina Fosina. It's the only species of porpoise we have on the east coast. I've seen dead ones, especially in Dare County, especially in the month of February. 
most years, some years not any or just one or two, some years as many as 10 to 15. I think they're all juveniles, but again, uh, we don't see live healthy porpoises here. I think this is the extreme southern limit of their range, harbor porpoise, but we do have harbor porpoises and uh, I think it's fair to consider them North Carolina wildlife, but this isn't part of their normal range. We do find them here uh, dead, typically, occasionally dying. And Stephanie, our uh, whiz in the graphics department, the Maritime Museum created this for me, which I really love, to highlight the difference between the larger bottlenose dolphin and then the slightly smaller harbor porpoise overlaid on it with smaller dorsal fins and no prominent beak or rostrum, and then the mahi-mahi or dolphin fish. So if you see dolphin on a menu, at least in this country, they're referring to mahi-mahi, also called dorado, also called the dolphin fish, not the mammal. Hope that makes sense. Another difference, uh, we, happen to work, we happen to be working on two skeletons of juvenile. Uh, on the right is a bottlenose dolphin, on the left is a harbor porpoise, I just put this together to highlight another difference, which is in their teeth. Harbor porpoises have much smaller, and I think more teeth, and they're very different shaped. They're kind of flat and, and uh, spatula shaped, as opposed to the larger, more conical shaped teeth of a bottlenose dolphin on the right. I hope that's helpful. And a big thanks to all the people and volunteers and colleagues and coworkers associated with our the collaborating institutions that are shown here. And uh, I, I've heard, I've seen it on Facebook, so it must be true, that if you put a Protect Wild Dolphins license plate on your car, your car will go faster, it'll last longer, you'll look younger, you'll look sexier, and you will be supporting the work that I've presented in, in, in this slideshow. Because friends of the museum, uh, who attempt to raise money to support this work uh, gets $20 per Protect Wild Dolphin plate that's on the road, and it's extremely helpful. So thank you, North Carolina drivers who have a Protect Wild Dolphins license plate on your car. And that's it. I hope this was helpful or interesting or at least entertaining. Signing off for now, Keith Rittmaster, North Carolina Maritime Museum.